Okay, so you're you're looking at lactate not so much as a problematic compound, which it has been kind of labeled over the years, but more so as a window into the mitochondria to tell you how well the mitochondria in that person is functioning. So when you looked at people with metabolic syndrome, what you saw compared to sort of average people and elite athletes was that for a given sort of intensity, they were producing much more lactate. And so that was telling you that their mitochondria was not as healthy and not functioning as well as the others who at that same intensity were producing much less lactate. Yes, exactly. It's a, it's a great surrogate to see what's the mitochondrial function and, and it's going to become more and more uh, uh, part of the regular blood analysis that people do, uh, like when people look at uh, blood glucose levels, like what, what are your resting blood glucose levels, right? So soon uh, we're going to see what are your resting lactate levels. Uh, because what we see in populations with uh, metabolic syndrome um, uh, or obesity uh, or type 2 diabetes, we see that uh, at rest, they have about two to three times the level that healthy people have. So if we have at rest, if you look at athletes, their resting levels of lactate are 0 0.6, 0 0.8. Uh, moderately active individuals, healthy individuals, this is kind of our standard. How would we like to be? We are around one millimol. But we see that people with uh, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, uh, cardiometabolic disease, they have at rest, uh, many of them, uh, two to three millimoles. So that, that's about two to three times um, uh, the, the levels that um, uh, health individuals have. So imagine um, that your blood glucose levels are two times or three times uh, as high as uh, what the normal should be in health individuals, right? So I think that this is it's getting to be, it's going to be more and more a parameter um, uh, for health, uh, resting lactate levels. Um, yeah, but that, but that lactate, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it's a great fuel. So that's the other thing too. Lactate we've seen as a toxic product is, is probably the best fuel in the body because uh, it's, 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 it's it's, it's, it's metabolized faster than glucose, significantly faster than glucose. So if you give uh, most cells in the body the possibility of, of use glucose or, 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 or lactate, they're going to prefer to use lactate. The brain is a great lactate user. The heart is a great lactate user. The kidneys, the muscles, obviously. But it happens in mitochondria. So you need to have a good mitochondrial function. And, and the problem is not when it comes to exercise, it's not the lactate, but it is the hydro hydrogen ions associated to lactate, which elicit an acidic microenvironment in the muscle. This is the other thing that we see in cancer, the famous now uh, tumor microenvironment, which is the, the microenvironment around cancer cells, which is very acidic. And that's a niche for cancer growth, for carcinogenesis, for metastasis, right? That is a big deal area, of a big area of research now and, uh, and, and that tumor microenvironment and that, that, that acidic microenvironment is caused by lactate from, from the tumor cells, which is dysregulated. In skeletal muscle, is dysregulated during exercise and, uh, um, or accumulates in people who don't clear it correctly into energy. And, and those hydrogen ions accumulate and they might, it's, it's part of the fatigue, not everything by no means. There are multiple aspects of fatigue, central fatigue, peripheral fatigue local fatigue that we still are trying to understand and explain. But this is a part of that where uh, excess of hydrogen ions from lactate can impair both the speed and the force of muscle contraction. Okay, so lactate itself is not necessarily a problem if we can clear it and we can shuttle it back in and use it as an energy substrate. But if our mitochondria are dysfunctional, it can build up. And along with that lactate coming for the ride are these hydrogen ions, which change the pH within the cell that then can affect, perhaps contribute to fatigue and, and power. Yes, yes. And, and, and when it comes to disease, 
uh, it's lactate, um, it's, it's highly related to disease, you know, when it's not, when it accumulates chronically, because during exercise, lactate, even in, in a, in a people, in, in, in a person who is not fit, lactate is going to accumulate fast. But when the exercise ceases, uh, lactate levels don't accumulate, return back to baseline. But in diseases like cancer, or when there's a significant mitochondrial dysfunction in people with type 2 diabetes, that lactate accumulates chronically, right? And especially in cancer, the more aggressive the cancer is, the more lactate is produced. And uh, through our research, we're showing that lactate acts, acts as an oncometabolite. That is, it's, uh, it regulates the expression of, uh, uh, of uh, sorry, the, it regulates the genetic expression of, uh, of, uh, of the, uh, the, the expression of the, ma- of the most important genes involved in, uh, in cancer. We, we're doing this with uh, breast cancer. We have published one paper. We have another one in, uh, in under review now. And, and then we, we have two more papers coming out with, lo- with two types of lung cancers. Um, and then we also see that um, lactate also um, uh, regulates the, the uh, transcription of the uh, main proteins that are dysregulated in cancer. And, and, and now we're just trying to intervene. And, and the study that we have now under, re- under review, uh, we are um, with genetic engineering, we're knocking out, knocking down, sorry, the, the, the enzyme that produces lactate, which is LDHA. And then uh, in breast cancer cells, we see that when we knock out that uh, enzyme, uh, no lactate is produced and uh, no gen- no, uh, there's no protein expression of those dysregulated proteins uh, coming from dysregulated genes in cancer, right? So it's a key regulator of, of, of cancer uh, that already Otto Warburg a century ago uh, proposed uh, because now we talk a lot, we hear a lot about sugar, the connection of sugar and cancer, right? Um, and that comes from the uh, renaissance of, of the Warburg effect. So Otto Warburg, discovered in 1923 that uh, cancer cells, they utilized a lot of glucose. And that was the first uh, uh, metabolic transformation of a normal cell into a cancer cell, characterized by that. But what really struck Warburg was the excessive amount of lactate produced by by cancer cells. Now, uh, that was back in the days, unfortunately, he didn't have the technology that we have nowadays to understand that better. and, And they were not the genes were not discovered, right? And uh, so, but um, but yeah, um, uh, he already, he was so smart and so ahead of us that a century ago, he already posited that cancer could be a metabolic disease, which is not quite entirely correct, but there's no doubt that the metabolic uh, um, um, factor in cancer is crucial. But the way how he described an injury of, of, of cellular respiration or, or mitochondrial function was lactate because he, he already saw, okay, wait a minute. If lactate cannot be oxidized or burned in mitochondria of cancer cells, um, is because mitochondria are not working properly. So maybe there's an injury of cellular respiration. So th- this is the main thing that he proposed a uh, hundred years ago. Yeah, that's f- fascinating. And some, some cutting edge sort of insights, I guess, into where the, the world of cancer research and, and treatment might be headed from a metabolic health point of view. 